Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Haas. I'm a second grade teacher in Columbia, South Carolina, and also a Midlands area rep for SC for Ed. And this is an installment that we're doing as part of a series where we're trying to reach out to voters and help them know a little more information about the people who are running for office in their areas, particularly in regard to what are their thoughts and plans around public education in the state of South Carolina. So this is Senate District 14, and we have Sarah Work with us. Um, her opponent, Harvey Peeler, running on the Republican ticket, was also invited to come, but he declined our invitation to show up. So if you want to know more about um, Senator Peeler's stances on public education, I suggest maybe you reach out to him and hope for a reply that way. So let's get started. Maybe you could just take a moment to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your party and your platform and what's made you decide to run for office. Sure. Um, so my name is Sarah Work, and I am a mother of four. Um, three in the public school uh, uh, public school right now, uh, trying to figure out how we're going to manage going into the new school year with all this interesting um, dynamics here. Uh, I am uh, also a small business owner, and actually, I just finished my CARES Act extension deadline because um, I'm, I'm a CPA. I work with taxes, so we just finished uh, getting out the last extensions for those who didn't extend in April for the CARE Act now that everyone's ready until October. So the Alliance Party is actually used to be called the American Party the last election cycle and it's recently uh, rebranded and we are actually trying to build a national coalition of independent and minded individuals um, to get independents elected nationwide. And we actually will even have a presidential candidate on the ticket in November. So that's exciting. Uh, the Alliance Party is really uh, um, an open, ethically motivated uh, political organization that is just trying to bring common sense, middle grounds kind of thinking to bring solutions to every legislature in the union, uh, even, even the, the national legislature, uh, government, however you want to look at it. We're just trying to bring common sense thinking to, to politics, which there's not much of that anymore. Uh, so, and the reason I'm running for South Carolina Senate District 14 was because nobody else was running against Harvey Peeler. Uh, so I figured that, you know, Considering he's been in office longer than I've been alive, um, I thought, why not give him a run for his money? And um, the interesting thing is when I was discussing running either against a uh, county, uh, county commissioner or running against the incumbent South Carolina Senate District 14 uh, individual, well, the, the county commissioner is a woman and you know nobody really has any fists against her. And the obviously the Senate... Um, I think he's the Senate president now. He, he's been there forever. And um, discussing this with my 12 year old, she said, well, mom, the, the choice is obvious. You gotta run against the old guy. <laughs> so um, so I, put in, I put in my hat for uh, this race purely on the fact that nobody else is running against him and why not? So- yeah. um, I believe we have fewer than five women in the Senate here in South Carolina. Sure. That's true too, and that was one of the that was one of the overriding reasons as well. Is just because I think that you know for proper proper percentages and representation, I think that women should put themselves out there a little bit more because you can't get anywhere if you don't you make yourself available. So, yeah. so my first question for you is, and this is kind of unique right now because we're in the midst of a very different sort of environment in terms of thinking about public education, because there's a lot of talk going on about um, what school looks like in the midst of a pandemic. And you can touch on a little bit that if you want, but that really wasn't at the heart of this question, which is when you look at the state of public education in the state of South Carolina, what are some things that really stand out to you? What are some things that maybe you're concerned about? And um, just, just how do you feel about how things are going at present? Uh, well, I thought things were going pretty well um, before the governor made his announcement today that he was going to push school back until after Labor Day. Um, and I really, um, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons where I'm not really sure that makes a lot of sense, considering we've had like a spike in COVID cases after every major holiday, the 4th of July, 
Memorial Day. It just seems to like, why would you wait until after Labor Day to send kids back to school after they've had, you know, more exposure, you know, given another holiday? Um, I'm the state of public education in South Carolina. It is so varied. So many different districts have resources while others don't really have resources. Trying to find balance between the haves and the have nots is is one of the largest and most pressing questions we've had as a nation. And um, unfortunately, a lot of it comes down to like racial divide as well. Uh, I mean, statistically speaking, it's it's been at, you know, in every kind of if you just look at the numbers, it's the truth is there. It doesn't you don't have to you know look at. You don't have to look at uh, even color, really. Just you know, where's the money? Where where's the where are the resources? You can tell that children do better where resources are available. And if resources aren't available because of you know economic issues, we have to figure a way to redistribute them. And I think that's the biggest issue. Like the and even discuss or, you know, reviewing what Mr. Uh, Governor McMaster said in his meeting today uh, or his press conference about how all the, the government has pushed money to this, to the state to help fight this COVID in schools. I'm really kind of wondering like how the resources, are they going to be used for, you know, personal protection or are they going to be used for, you know, cleaning? It's, it's not really been like clearly outlined as to, are we going to hire more teachers? You know, if teachers get sick, do they get paid um, for their time off? Because, you know, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Does your, you know, your class then have to be quarantined for 14 days? There's a lot of questions that aren't being answered. And, and I, and it makes it difficult for parents to make decisions. And I know that a lot of people want their kids to go back to school, but at the same time, you know, we were risking, risking the health of parents and teachers and grandparents. And, you know, it just seems to expound almost. And it's, it's complicated. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm at the sidelines waiting for, waiting for decisions to be made. And, and I can only imagine how teachers feel, especially after, you know, like our school district had already made a plan and I was, we had all like mentally like settled on it. But then the governor just kind of like took a left turn when everyone was going straight. So um, there's a lot of challenges and not, and I mean, we could go on and on and on and on all day about how, how best to address them. But, you know, unless, until I'm elected and able to get in there and, and try to put my opinion and, and speak to the floor, um, trying to get some kind of compromise going, it's really hard to say exactly how what so, so. so thinking about priorities then if you were elected what would be your first actionable item that you would hope to take up in the legislature on behalf of public education definitely um working on getting i'm not sure is the is the entire state of south carolina one-to-one -one elect like device wise largely so but not absolute no i think that i think the the first one would be to make sure that technology was in everyone's hands, not just in those who have the resources. And that um, might look different when we come out of this pandemic because with CARES money, they've made moves to secure mm -hmm. obviously broadband capabilities, but also make sure that we have devices available for children who might right. not be able to physically attend school. So that might look different in the next few months than it did say last year. Right, and I think that that would be my number one priority is because because of the lim the limits of COVID and in the situation that we're in, I would want to make sure that access to the access to the technology was available for everyone, not just those who you know have had it before. So um, that would be my number one. Okay. And then so a big issue. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you have something else? I was I was going to say, and that includes getting you know broadband because in like in our district, they were actually going to provide for those who can't afford um, like internet in their homes or couldn't get to it, um, we were going to, they were offering hotspots. So um, that's, that was one of the ways that they were working around the broadband issue or the internet access issue was to offer hotspots to families who either couldn't afford it or um, couldn't get access to their house because they're so remote. 
So one big issue that often comes up when we, when discussion of education emerges is, is funding. So I don't know if you're aware, I'll give you a little bit of background first. Um, our state has, they established the own, they established the formula by which we establish, we determine whether or not they're fully funding public education. Mm -hmm. For the last 12 years, they have not fully funded our schools by account, most recently about $600 per student. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the argument is if we could find that money, we would invest it in education, but we don't have the money. So if funding is an issue in education, how do you think we might go about addressing that? Finding funding for education. Um, that's, so that's, that's, a, that's another one of those questions for the ages. Uh, I know that I know that in our district, they rely heavily upon the generosity of parents to donate to the school, to, to donate to the, each specific school in turn. And again, you run into those, the haves and the have nots. Uh, the, you know, obviously there's always the question of whether or not property taxes are too low in the state of South Carolina. I know that I benefit from them personally as, you know, versus cause we're here in York County, I'm very close to Charlotte and seeing the, the prices of property taxes in Charlotte versus the property taxes here in South Carolina. It's, it's mm -hmm. obvious why people are moving to South Carolina, um, for property tax purposes and the schools are better, um, than they are in Charlotte. So, you know, so there, I mean, I think that there is a little bit of wiggle room within property taxes, but uh, the other question, I guess, then would be, well, what about areas that are, that have, you know, lower property values, the, obviously, you're, and, or their economic status is not to the point where they're going to be able to pay more in property taxes. So I think the question might be more of where can we save in other areas of government? Like where can we redistribute funding from something else uh, or, you know, pinch the pennies in one area in order to improve the school, you know, the, the cost per, or improve the cost funding per child um, in the school system. And honestly, I've not- So what that we brought up in the past is just the number of, um the amount of taxes, the billions of dollars of taxes that we lose every year because we offer those to corporations of business that come to our state who then operate tax-free. So our tax base drops and then the money that we have to invest into our schools, that's been an, an issue. Um, but yeah, funding is always a difficult topic because without funding, we see things like we have now. We begin each school year in our state with about a thousand fewer teachers than we have positions to fill. So a lot of those just get dissolved and we see those kids get distributed to other classrooms. We see classroom mm -hmm. sizes go up mm -hmm. to the tune of we're losing about 6,000 teachers a year, but we're only graduating about 1,700 because we've seen a 30% reduction in the number of people going into education, not mm -hmm. just because of salary and funding issues, but a number of other issues related to, um, to education as well. So they, they are definitely serious issues and you're right, it's a complicated topic, but it's one that needs to find, we need to find solutions for because mm -hmm. our kids and their education are important to us. Well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned businesses because one of the things that businesses always like to see when they when they think about relocating to a new area is whether or not um, the school district is any good because employees don't want to move to you know employees don't want to come to a school district that is um, or that is not funded enough to to where their employees children will have proper education or enough of an education. So I think almost I wonder if it would be more of like selling it to businesses like, hey, you know, we're kind of, you know, underfunded. Um, do you mind, you know, could we negotiate some kind of either annual annual donation to this local school district based on, you know, revenues or, you know, kind of almost like an ownership. Almost like if if we give you these tax credits, we want it, we want a, like a percentage of your distributions that you give to your shareholders or something like that. So just because if you're um, like, or we want we want a stake in your in your business because if you if you do well, then we do well. Like in South Carolina, so um, you know if we're giving you the benefit of of the tax break by moving to South Carolina. Well, I would like a percentage of interest so that annually I can have distributions to help support the schools that your employees utilize. So maybe something like that. 
So my last question has to do with assessment. And you said you have three public school age children. How, mm -hmm. what grade are they in? So seventh, fourth, and first. And okay. then my four-year-old didn't make the cut for public pre-K, okay. so. Which might yeah. be better because, um, you know, if they're not sure about how all this is going, I think the daycare is probably the place for her anyway. <laughs> so. so your fourth and seventh graders certainly know about testing and, and the things that we do to assess our schools, assess our districts, assess our, our children. What do you think ideally, or how do you think ideally should we go about determining if our kids are being successful in school or if our schools are being successful? We know the models in place and, and you can draw from that if you want or you could suggest something totally different. Um, but how should we be assessing our schools, our kids, and our districts? Um, that's a good question. And even my first grader takes MAP testing. Um, and in kindergarten, she took MAP testing as a, first, as a kindergartner. So I'm not sure why, but I guess they wanted to know where her asset to assess her, I guess. Um, but I have, um, when I was in college, one of my professors um, I think she wisely said, you cannot um, determine whether or not a child is starving by weighing them. And children learn differently and some don't test well. And I know that for my fourth, my fourth grader, for whatever reason, she needs to be in a room full of other kids when she tests. If, if they put her like in a, in like a room off of the principal's office to do her map testing, it's, she like absolutely like fails miserably every time. But if she's in a room surrounded by your peers like that, I don't know if it's just a comfort level, like a mental thing, um, she ultimately does really, really well. Um, I, think, I think that there needs to be a multi-level assessment, almost kind of like they, what they do for kindergarten, um, where they you know, evaluate their writing based on a, you know, a level kind of comparatively, not necessarily picking out specifically what they're doing wrong, but like just to show where their development is against a, you know, a metric. Um, but also, you know, is the child grasping the concepts? You don't have to test if for that, if you can, if you can see that they're, you know, they're getting it in homework and they're asking questions in class. It's hard to put that into a context to, to measure against the state and against other states. But I think that um, like some, some places have even thought of, about going away from ACT testing and SAT testing because it can be skewed based on whether or not you know what maroon is or you know the color maroon is you know really red or something you know something just trivial like that where maybe it's not you know when you're in kindergarten you learn red orange yellow green blue purple but you don't learn maroon you know so if, what is maroon to someone well it might be purple it might be red you know it doesn't the context might be out and i think that i think that it needs to be addressed and Definitely, I think that there's a better way to weigh students who are starving um, than just by testing them. Uh, and, I, and I think that the sad thing is, is that so many times those children go, go unnoticed because um, either their, their parents can't get them to school or, um, you know, there's family medical or monet monetary issues. Um, I think that, again, the inequities in those situations really need to be, I think it starts more at the personal level and then you work up to like the, the educational comparative, like statewide. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to mentally like put out my thoughts and <laughs> I'm not sure I'm doing all that well of a job, good job, good of a job, yeah, but yeah. I'm trying. Yeah, absolutely. I think you did a good job. So in closing, is there anything that you'd like to revisit from before or just any last words that you'd like to share if you're speaking out directly to potential voters in your district? Um, let's see. I want, I want the best for South Carolina because I look at the future of South Carolina every day. It's 
you know, in in my house running around screaming right now. I'm so glad you guys can't hear it. Um, but I want the best for my children. And, and in order to do that, I feel as though we are depriving ourselves of opportunity by putting ourselves in tribes. You know, the Democrat tribe versus the Republican tribe. I think that people need to stop and think about and vote for people, not party, because um, I'm not sure what our current senator in this in the South Carolina Senate District 14 has given the people of South Carolina in the last 40 years. Um, but I know that I I want to do better, and I think that the first thing I want to do is to um, have fair votes and um, fair maps in the state of South Carolina so that there are no gerrymandered districts. And I want to end term limits so that there are uh, no quote unquote sacred cows that can park themselves in the Senate for 40 years um, with really um, not sure exactly why. Um, and then um, finally, I want to I want to bring South Carolina, all of South Carolina, um, into the information, into the onto the information highway, because the best decisions are made when you have the most information and the most, you know, responsibly sourced information possible. So I think having, you know, making sure people have access to those resources is paramount. So those are my goals. I hope you'll vote for me. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending a few moments with us this evening and speaking out to voters in Senate District 14. And I wish you the very, very best. Thank you very much. I like your purple shirt. Yeah.